get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like Andrew Warner. I'm also proudly the producer at one of the best business podcasts, Mixergy. And today, I have a great friend, colleague, mentor, Andrew Warner. Andrew, a little bit about him in his 20s, used credit cards and ingenuity to build a $30 million a year in sales internet business with his younger brother. Andrew, you know I come prepared, so I'm going to have an intro for you. I know that, actually. Yeah. That's actually put me so much at ease here. I said, it doesn't matter that I've got so much going on today. Jeremy knows this stuff. Right, right. It's going to work out. So after selling his internet, uh, his interest in that business, Andrew went on to create a top-rated business podcast, Mixergy, where he's interviewed thousands of top entrepreneurs, many ambitious. This is the most, you know, Andrew, for me, this is the most impressive part. Many ambitious entrepreneurs listen to interviews to build their businesses and then they come back on to tell their success stories. And it's some of the best content you can get on the internet about building business. Andrew, that should be your new intro for Mixergy. Thanks for doing this. I dig it. Yeah. Good to have, uh, good to have you on here. I'm, yeah. I'm so used to welcoming people <laughs> on my interview program. It's good to be here with you. Yeah. So this is part of the Pro Podcaster series where we talk about the behind the scenes of how pro podcasters outsource and automate workflow, which is the non-sexy stuff that makes things run and how to produce the high quality podcast from beginning to end. So I thought, you know, you've done thousands and thousands of these. I thought you would start with one case early on when you were in, in the hustle mode. Yeah, you bet. So now our system is super detailed and it right. just freaking works. And I, and I know that we're going to get to talk about how it works right now, but I don't want to overwhelm people. And it's a good place to start with uh, a time before the system was fully in place. Back when no one knew who I was, I wanted to get big name guests. And there was this guy, Derek Sivers, who had sold his company CD Baby for about $20 million. And he was writing these incredible blog posts about entrepreneurship and life, and he had this huge following. And I happened to see him on a message board responding to questions from people. And he said, and if anyone ever needs my help, I'd be happy to to help out. I thought, I'm going to jump on that. So I got his email address, and I think it was even on his site. It's like Derek at Sivers.org or something (laughs) really simple like that. Yeah. Um, (laughs) I don't think that he's hiding that stuff, and it's not hard to find email addresses I've discovered. So I shot him an email. I said, you offer to help anyone here in this community. I'd love to interview you because first, it'll help me grow my interview site, but also you'll be helping tons of entrepreneurs who will be listening to this interview one day. At the time, there weren't tons of entrepreneurs listening. But you know, if if he did it, I believed in time people would find that interview and keep listening, which is proven to be true. And so I jumped on it just as he wrote it. He responded right away because he remembered the the forum that we were on. He um, he appreciated the fast response, and he and I recorded very quickly. And this was back before I was doing video interviews. And I remember recording on Skype with him and saying, I should just ask him to hit the video button. Back then, it was just all audio. It was just like, I'm so lucky this guy's even on with me. I shouldn't even ask him for video. But I wish I had just said, hey, you know what, Derek? There's a little video button right there. Let's you and I both turn on the video so we can see each other in the eyes and have a real conversation. But I didn't do that. I was very nervous, frankly, to even be doing interviews in the first place, knowing that people will be judging me, knowing that people will it's be It's so watching. funny to think back on that, right? Yeah. And, and in those moments, what I remember doing is the same thing I still do to this day. It's saying, what am I curious about with Derek? What do I really want to know? I have my shot here. I can ask anything I want. Right. And by tuning out all the doubt and tuning out all the other people who are in the audience and just zeroing in on what's my personal need here from this conversation. The conversation was real and I was able to really learn from him and it really is one of the most popular interviews on the site and one of the best ones. So how long, I want to talk about the process for that for a second. So in that situation, there was no process to say of a pre-interview or or anything like that. And then after you hit the stop record, what was the process like early on in those days to actually get it out to be a blog post? You know post? what? Here's what I will say that happened before I even hit record and got yeah. on a call that I actually had seen other interviewers not do specifically with him and it bugged me. Mm-hmm. I did a little research on him. And so I looked up his story to see where he made his money. 
did he really own CD Baby or was he just a guy who pretended to own CD Baby? Did he really sell the company? What was it about? What was his story of why he was so successful with CD Baby? What did he do with his money afterwards? And so I knew things like the guy donated his money to to uh, a nonprofit to help kids learn music. And I remember months later hearing someone else do an interview with Derek. And I was really fascinated because I wanted to learn more about Derek. And the guy asks him, so what would you do with the money? I go, this is the stupidest interview I've ever seen. That stuff is so public. <laughs> Derek is so right. proud of the fact that he donated all his money. Yeah. Right. The goal of the interview is not to rehash stuff that's already out there. It's right. to understand more. Right. And for me, my follow-up question for it was, I knew that he donated his money. I was really curious about whether he'd found a tax-saving loophole in our system by <laughs> donating money. Because if he had, that's a good thing for all of us to know. Right. I know what he did was he took the money and he put it in, into, uh, I think it was a trust or something. It's been a few years. So I don't remember the specific details of yeah. what he did with it. But he put it aside and he was going to live off the interest rate from it. Yeah. And so does that mean that he now gets to keep 100% of the sale right. price? And in, right. And I wanted to right. know that. And You want to get deeper. Yeah, right. And so I did do that research ahead of time. It yeah. doesn't take that long. Frankly, here's what I do and what I did even back then. I would not start research until maybe 45 minutes before the call. Okay. At first, it was a procrastination thing where I just felt so overwhelmed by all the things I thought I had to learn about my guest. It's true. Yeah. Later on, I realized that if I wait 45 minutes before the interview, I'll rush through the research and I'll do as much research as I can and... It's often enough, frankly, even 10, yeah. 15 minutes. I have is that enough problem. To get story. Yeah, I have the problem with the opposite. Like I start what too do you early, do? too early, and then I just end up going through way too much. Whereas if you do do like an hour before, you can get a lot done in that hour. Yeah, work yeah. does take up as much time as you give it. Yeah. And so that helped. I did do a little version of a pre interview. What I used to do is I'd say to guests, look, I really want to do a great job in this interview. So let me ask you a couple of things here just to be clear. First of all, is it pronounced Sivers or Sivers? I didn't know at the time, right? So I check a couple of things like that. And That's then I an important point, though, actually, because I've seen ones where they ask them in the intro, is this how pr that they're recording? And that just, why not just do it ahead of time so you're prepared? Yeah. 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 You I, I will even go look on YouTube videos for speeches given by the person or about the person and just see how people pronounced it. That's like the first five seconds of an in, of a video. Yeah. So I don't even have to do that much uh, work to find out the yeah. pronunciation. But I can also, before we start, say, hey, I want to be clear about how you pronounce your name so I don't make a mistake here because I know people will be listening and mimicking what I say. So how do you pronounce your name? Mm -hmm. And then I get that. Uh, and then once the interview is over, you're asking what I do. Yes. I, in the hustle days, in the hustle days. So like back to Derek Sivers days, days cuz it now it's a different. Lot of, yeah. A lot of thank yous, a lot of appreciation. Sometimes I would ask for advice, so now once it's done, do you have any advice for how I could promote it because I think it's so good I want a lot of people to watch mm. it. Sometimes it was asking for referrals. Derek, you're an entrepreneur. Mm. I know you study this space a lot. Is there someone that you admire that you think I should be doing interviews? Mm -hmm. Sometimes it was just thank you and then hang up and go catch my breath. You know, just relax a little bit. Uh, and then after that, what I used to do was, I think with Derek, yeah, I'm 99% sure yeah. that with Derek, what I did was I did the editing myself. So now you have a file on your computer, you drag it into what were you using in those days? Uh, right from the start, I used, almost from the start, I used Ecamm Call Recorder to record. Yep. There was a period there where I used Audacity, which is an audio recorder that lets you record what comes into your mic and what comes out of your computer. Right. And, and that was pretty good. At the time, I used to edit in Audacity. Hmm. So Ecamm Call Recorder or Audacity, both yeah. those programs allow you to have one audio file for yeah. your voice, one audio file for your guest voice. And so at the time, what I used to do was just kind of level the volumes because I have a better mic than my guests do. And so sometimes I have to adjust their volume levels to match mine. Mm -hmm. um, and around that time, but I didn't do it with Derek. Around that time, what I used to do was go in and edit out all the ums and the mm, ahs. Really? Wow. How long did that take? An insane amount of time. It was just like three times as long as the interview to wow. go and pull those out. Because once you get the ums, you realize, well, sometimes you cut the um, but you also cut off the first part of the word. So you have to make sure to get that right or to not cut that um because it's impossible. Um, 
I there's my um I would have edited that out. It also people is don't a problem even pay attention. Because Do people really care? Nobody cares. I actually think that interviews sound and conversations sound more real with those ums in there. Yeah. And you can kind of see that when you watch certain TV shows where they kind of work the word um and like into the conversation. You definitely see it in NPR's podcast where they have this tight, tight editing and they still keep in that halting, second guessing voice almost because that's the way people talk and it sounds more realistic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like I, I, um, I work with a videographer who shot one of the courses for us and I asked to see some of his other work and he showed me how he will actually do a green screen with some of his clients, rent out space in New York, like a full floor of space, shoot that space from every angle and then take his green screen client, just the video of the client and pop them into this uh, beautiful space in New York. And I said, and then you just play what he says? He says, no. So what do you do? He says, we record the hums and the background noise in the space. Mm. Because if we just had him talk like he's in a studio, into a studio mic, and placed his video into the space, it would feel wrong. Wow. Because people expect certain background noises when it's a real situation, when someone's really standing in Manhattan. Not necessarily horns. They understand that they're, they're noise-canceling like windows. like gunshots. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. But it makes it feel much yeah. more real. And the same thing happens in conversations. My, my conversations with the ums not being there felt a little bit off. Like we hit that uncanny valley. So yeah. I did that at the time. Not so. I don't think I did it for Derek Sivers. I think I used to do intros. I'm 90% sure that at the time I did intros where I would record them afterwards saying, here's what I was trying to get out of this interview and mm -hmm. here's what's valuable. Yeah, for sure. You do sum up, you know, you'd sum up and what was valuable from it. Yeah. I kind of like that and I'd like to still do it, but it's, it's a way of giving you space to second guess yourself for me anyway, to just record into the mic on my own. And I think that recording it with the guest is more valuable because the guest knows what's coming up. Like you and I just sat here as you were doing the intro and I knew the direction you were going in. You said pro podcaster as you said that it was part of a series. I said, all right, I know who this audience is and I know what it's about and now I've bought into your mission. Mm -hmm. And so now you've edited it. What did you do with it at the time? At the time, I such a stupid mistake. I just uploaded it to one of the folders on my domain where WordPress was. Okay. And the reason it's a stupid mistake is because it just slows down the server to have that audio file on there. It takes up a ton of space. It's just it's just a big, big fat file in a place that's not meant for big fat files. Mm -hmm. And so it, it made it really hard for me to keep my site up. It made it really hard for me to move my site to another host. Mm -hmm. What it were you using just, at the time? What host? Do you remember? Um, I do remember, I don't want to say because I might have okay. complained about them in the okay. past. <laughs> um, we'll just talk about your current sponsor. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I realized that that problem wasn't my host and my host just didn't, didn't have a phone number for me to talk to. to they would have told yeah. me. Sorry. It wasn't supposed to, it wasn't meant for that. Yeah. You don't put, upload your files. You, I now know to move them somewhere where they belong. In fact, mm -hmm. the next iteration of the site, I... The next evolution, I should say, of the podcast included me uploading all my interviews to Amazon S3. Their simple storage solution yeah. was inexpensive and it was meant to host all these files. And frankly, it doesn't matter where you host your files as long as you link them up properly. Mm -hmm. So I moved to that. Okay. Today, frankly, because of you, we recorded a course on how to do uh, how to do interviews. And you showed in that course how you uploaded your files to Libsyn. I showed how I upload my files to, to Amazon S3. And I realize you get way better data than I do. You have uh, a service that actually works and is meant for podcasting. And I said, why don't I just do what Jeremy does? And I switched over to Libsyn. Yeah, so anyone could, can check out Interview Your Heroes, where we actually go and dive. I mean, this is just going to talk the broad process on what you automate and, and outsource. But that is like the nut and bolts of how you actually do an interview and, and beyond that. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, and I learned, as you can see, a lot from that. And I understand my mindset at the time. I thought, why pay for another hosting company to host my audio files if I'm already paying for a, a website company, right? To, I mean, yeah. a, a site to host my website. 
why don't I just upload it to there? And for a long time, it didn't make much of a difference, right? You upload your first file, not much of a difference. It's just another 60, 80, 80 megabytes if you're, you know, right. if you're uploading that, what I was If it's audio, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And another and another and another. And before you know it, you got gigs up there. And yeah. they're not really meant to handle all that space. Yeah. And you don't get any data on it. And it becomes problematic in lots of different ways. So I wish I hadn't done that from the start. I wish I just trusted Libsyn and known that I could move away. But today we're with Libsyn, and yeah. if we do have a problem, we can we could always move away. We should totally <laughs> post this in the interview your heroes or something like that. Yeah, this yeah. little clip. Anyways, yeah. go. Yeah, here's what I learned. Uh, the next thing that I did after that was I wrote up a post with a headline with some text, and I think at the time I don't know for sure if it was about Derek. I would often post a couple of things that I learned about about, uh, about entrepreneurship from that interviewee. Mm -hmm. And then I would post it. And when I posted it, I would check in with the guest and say, here, the interview's up. If I got any of it wrong, like the headline, your bio, et cetera, let me know. The number one thing, you won't believe, the number one thing that, I, that people corrected me on much more than anything else was the photo. Hmm. Andrew, could you use a better photo? Andrew, here's another photo that I prefer. Even if I pulled a photo off of their own website, they would often ask for a better one because the way they look mattered often more than what they said. Hmm. They understood that people would just glance at the page, decide whether they wanted the interview or not, and decide whether they liked the guy or not in a couple of seconds. Yeah. So I did that. And then here's a the final step that I did. I promoted it. And especially in the hustler phase, I would go on to different message boards and promote it. I would talk to the guest and ask him to promote it. I would ask my friends to promote it and just really look for every single person that I can to come and watch it. Yeah. So how long did it take you think at that time from when you interviewed someone for it to actually post on your site? Almost the next day. The next day, really? That quickly? Wow. I, I really wanted to get into a rhythm where I would publish every single day and publish like deep interviews, well-researched, um, where the answers weren't predictable, where we were just, I really wanted to do it every single day and every single weekday. Yeah. And yeah. the only way to do that, I found, was to record the interview, then edit it, and then put it on my site and schedule it to post the next day. Yeah. So I would edit it later that day. I, I think it took me a while to get enough interviewees to be able to publish daily. And it took me a while to to get them to get enough interviewees and do research on them to be able to publish daily. Yeah, it's a lot of work. A it's lot a of work. lot of work. And I I was doing a lot of things that I didn't need to. Like I would record three videos introducing what's in the interview at the time. And I understand my my thinking. I I still believe that it's hard for a podcast to go viral. It's hard for an interview to go viral because there's. There's so much content in there. There's so much that you're asking somebody to listen to and then remember to come back and share. So I wanted something that was more shareable, something that let people know what was in this big hour-long program without having to listen to the big hour-long program. Mm -hmm. But those little two to four-minute clips would take me a long time to record. I, I yeah. second-guessed myself too much. I wasn't sure what to say. It's kind of odd for me to just talk to a camera. Yeah. When so, Andrew, when did you become overwhelmed with the process of doing it yourself, and you decided to get someone else to help? Um, it was pretty early on that I was overwhelmed, and it wasn't so much that there was a lot of work that went into it. But I don't know if you've ever had this experience where you have to do something on your own, and you start to procrastinate because there's no outside deadline. Yeah. And because you're procrastinating so much, the procrastination takes up a lot of your time. And, and other stuff piles up also. Yeah. yeah. And so I wouldn't quickly invite people to do interviews because there's no pressure to do it. And I wouldn't quickly edit because there's no pressure to do it. I, or at least I wouldn't quickly start editing. The actual editing process was fairly fast. And so all those things just kept building up and building up and making it hard. What... I finally did was it was someone who asked me for advice on interviewing that told me, hey, you should contact this con this company in Guatemala. They'll do your your whatever you need. And the only thing I could think to give them was video editing. And so that's when they started doing video editing for me. And if I was asking the person there to edit my videos every day, then I had to have a video every day for them to edit because that's what I committed to doing. And then that created more productivity from me. Yeah. 
and more work for them. And that's how I got started bringing yeah. more people on. Yeah. So it wasn't only it was that you were held accountable and now you, you're more productive because of that and also because you can hand the stuff off and worry start to worry about the actual interview and other things. Yeah. Yeah. And um, then um, the next person that I brought on, I think, came up because of an interview with A.J. Vaynerchuk, Gary Vaynerchuk's brother. And he said, Andrew, you're doing too much yourself. And I said, I know, I know. He said, you should ask for audience volunteers. And I said, I don't feel comfortable asking people to volunteer. He said, you should. People want to be a part of this. They're going to get a lot out of learning from, the, from you and seeing this process firsthand. And you're going to get some help so that you're not overwhelming yourself. And I said, well, could I possibly get someone to do? And he said, well, and he threw out a couple of ideas. And he said, one thing you could get them to do is book interviews for you. And I thought, all right, I don't know. And then there was someone <laughs> who was listening at the time. Jang, who emailed me, who said, I'd be happy to help you find guests. And she was out there getting to know a lot of entrepreneurs. And she started booking guests. And that was, I think, the next person who came on. What did you do? What process did she use to book the guests? Uh, hey, Andrew, I've got someone who I think would be a good guest. I would email them back and say, can I interview you on Friday I gotcha. at 11 a.m.? It's like an email intro. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So the next, so video or in the audio and then next, the, the booking, what was next? Um, I think for a long time, those were the big positions. Those are the big ones. Yeah. So I want to talk about when everything flowed and when you could worry just about the interview. But talk about, you know, one of the things that fell through the cracks with Sujin before uh, we had this actual process in place. What happened with Sujin? Yeah. Um some point, if you don't have a process, if it's all just winging it, saying, hey, email me a, a recommendation and I'll just book it via email myself, at some point, if you grow, it becomes too chaotic to actually work. And so what happened was I recorded this interview with Sujin Patel. I thought it was great. I still think it's one of my best interviews. He was really good at telling his story and he, he achieved a lot. And I thought, great. He's one of my interviewees. I got to know him. The audience got to know him. Life is good. And at some point it came out, I think you recognized it when you talked to him, that I didn't publish the interview. He asked. He said, um, my interview never never went out. What, is something going on with that? And, and he thought that there was something wrong with him or his interview or that I was making a value judgment on the information in the interview. Now, I had I'd talked to him before. We'd done work together. I mean, I, I talked to him after that. We'd done work together after that. I had dinner with him here in San Francisco after that. I had no clue that he wasn't on. I just assumed he was. I had no clue he felt that I just didn't want him on my site. And then it came out from you, and I started hunting it down, and I, I realized we recorded this interview. I got the transcript. I got the editing. Everything's done. It was never on the site. Where was the breakdown? I still to this day don't know where the breakdown was. And he's just one example yeah. of many different breakdowns that we had. A more common breakdown in the system, less hurtful to someone else, but much more common is I'd invite someone to do an interview. They wouldn't respond. And that was it. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, like there's they get no lost. understanding. That That's a great point. Yeah. Right. And I thought maybe they didn't like me. Maybe they didn't like my, my program. Maybe they didn't appreciate doing it. I didn't know what, what it was. And what we finally, when we had the process, were able to see was, hey, there are a lot of people who aren't making it to do interviews. He, we actually, once we had a clear system, and I could describe it in a moment, but once we had that clear system, we knew how many people we were, we were adding to the system and how many people actually got booked and recorded interviews on the site. We said, there's a dramatic difference between these two numbers. For every 100 people who we want to interview, we as now the team that built up, mm -hmm. only maybe 10 or 20 show up on the site. Where, where's the problem? And because we have a good system, we were able to go in and see every step of our process, get data on every step of our process and say, all right, here are all the places where we're losing them. One easy win is we ask someone to do an interview, they don't follow up. What if we just add another step after that that says, hey, I invited you to do an interview. I don't know if you saw the invitation, but I'd love to have you on. Would would you consider doing this? Or hit reply and let me know why not. I always want to learn. I don't want to push. Like That little step was dramatically helpful in getting our, our numbers up and getting more people on the site. Right. Right. And also in me feeling better about um, – about about how people felt about the site. Yeah. And so you know what, what the reason I was yeah. saying I'm um, a couple of times right now is yeah. I actually have the system up on my screen 
And here's how good it is. I don't know the people on the site. I don't know them until I'm ready to do an interview with them. Right. It looks like the founder of Quest, the bars that I've been eating every yeah. day, is going to be on Mixergy. And I had no idea. I saw that today account. too, actually. That's impressive. Yeah. And that happened without you. That happened completely without my knowledge until this point. I had no idea that, that this founder was going to come on. Yeah. And that's exciting to see that. Yeah. So yeah, talk, it's Quest talk Nutrition. about that. Yeah, yeah. So talk about that for a second, actually, that you bring yeah. that up. So what are you looking at for people who aren't seeing your screen? And then what had to happen to get him to where he is now in the in the pipeline? So if you want to look at him specifically. Yeah. And you're looking at pipe drive just for people who you, yeah. you set up a – go ahead. Yeah, I love pipe drive for this, but people can use other software for it too. The reason I like pipe drive is it's contact management software that's just geared towards getting a goal, right? Geared towards helping you take a person and close a sale with them. Geared towards helping you take a new person who you don't know and – get get an interview with them. Yeah. So what are some of the Every, columns that, that you're looking at? So it, it breaks down your goal into different steps. We have 10 steps for booking someone and getting them to do an interview on the site. And when you have a new person that you want in the system for us, when I have someone new to suggest to as an interview, goes that person gets a card in column one, which is suggest a guest. And then each step of the process has its own um, column. And so as we do the step, we move their card one as we do this step, we move their card one. Um, and I know people like other uh, CRMs. I just, what I want is a CRM that's not about staying in touch with someone, but about getting a result done. And that's what this is for. Um, so I can see here also how other people interacted with them. And it looks like someone named Erica Navarro came to Mixergy, filled out the form that we have uh, a link to on the bottom of the site that says suggest a guest. Erica suggested that we get the founder, Tom uh, Bilyeu, mm -hmm. to come and do an, an interview. Uh, let me see here. I'm reaching out to introduce you to Quest Nutrition as our co-founder and president. Tom Bilyeu would make an exceptional guest on your podcast. If you're not what, yet familiar with Quest, et cetera, she's telling me about it. It looks like she's a fan of, of uh, Mixergy or has read about Mixergy, and mm. she thinks that her, her boss would make a good guest. So mm. she's submitting them. So that submission yeah. would come into our system, and someone on the team, in this case Andrea, took the person's name and just put it into the first column in our system. Right. And someone else has to say, hey, you know what? Andrea is right. This person should do this interview, right? We want someone to oversee each potential guest mm -hmm. so that we're not just letting people on the site. Um, and in this case, that person was Ari. And Ari said, hey, here's a great story on this company. It's from Inc. Magazine. So she moved the guest to approved. And it looks like that happened a few days afterwards. Now, after that person was approved, we invited them. And I can actually see the email that we sent out. It says, hi, Erica. Thanks for suggesting Tom. We'd love to have him on as a guest of Mixergy. Here's the next step, et cetera. He did not respond uh, about a week later. So Andrea went back in the system and sent a follow-up. <laughs> this is email. a good example, right? Yeah. Right. So again, here's someone whose own employee suggested the person, and that person uh, did not respond. We would have lost them, but we yeah. sent a follow-up. Yeah. And I see the follow-up, actually. It looks like it went to Ami, who's also at Quest Nutrition, says, I'm following up because I don't see Tom scheduled yet on our calendar, et cetera. And it looked like we did not get a reply to that, to that interviewee. So this was August 2015. Andrea sent a reminder saying, hey, don't know if you missed this, but we'd like, we'd like your boss to come and do this interview. What do you say? We didn't get a response. She marked it lost. Then, September of 2015, we get an email from Ami, again, another person at Quest, asking us to bring the person back on. So we reopen the case. We say, okay, great. We can move on. They introduce us to a, someone who I think is an assistant. And boom, we actually, you know what, Jeremy? What? They didn't want to sit for a pre-interview, so we marked it as lost on October 2015. Then, January 2016, <laughs> we get an email back saying, hey, uh, we're interested again. What do you say? And that's when they booked the pre-interview for February 8th. That's the process. Now, this person would have completely b 
been lost if we didn't have a process. The process yeah. that first allowed someone to suggest their themselves or yeah. their boss as a guest on Mixergy, that's important. The process for following up if they don't yeah. do the interview. By the way, every time someone's lost, we also have to say why we were lost, why we didn't get them on the site. And so right. in this case, it might be we didn't hear back from them. Right. And so at some point when we need guests and we can't find guests, we could just go back and search for all the people who we lost because they didn't reply to us and invite them back one more mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. And we could send a personal message saying something like, five years ago we asked you to do an interview. We probably, you probably were too busy. Right. We'd still love to have you on because we're big fans of yours on Mixergy. Here's the link to get started. Right, right. And what's interesting about that is, so I emailed him three days ago. Since I'm doing a series of e-commerce interviews, I had no idea. I emailed three days ago just to, you know, actually asking. And then when I pulled up to, to have Pipedrive open for our session, I'm like, holy crap, he's going to be. <laughs> so I immediately saw that he was actually going to be featured. That's awesome. Um, so should we take Tom through what would happen after that, or should we? Because I want to. I'm looking up. We have like three minutes. I know you have Gary. You have Gary V coming on too, who you have to prepare for. Um, you know, I know. So I, yeah, you want to know what happens so, right after that? So Here's, I, I don't know if we should just maybe next time on Thursday just talk about Nathaniel and not try and rush. Let's through. go a little bit longer, and then I'll I'll go uh, gear up for okay. for Gary. You just tell me when, but but yeah, so. Anyways, just to say, you we interview them, so they pre-interview. Um, we send him a link. He schedules it. He does, you know, forty to sixty minute pre-interview, and then after we send a link to his assistant to book it, and that's where he's at right now. He's booked his interview. So I think so. But here's the here's the other place that we noticed. Yeah, uh, we were dropping people off. They do a pre-interview, and then they stop showing up. Like we'd send them a link saying, "Here, go do the interview now. You did all the hard work. Now it's time to get the attention." And they just didn't respond. So we added another section. I feel to like they just don't like Jeremy. Step. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. sorry? They just don't like Jeremy. That's why. You know, it, first yeah. of all, everyone loves yeah. working with you, which is really helpful. It's really good for them to get to know every step of the process and to like all the people because then they, if, the, if the process is done right and the people are good, they like us more for it. They admire us for it. They want to see how we do this so that they could learn how they can run their organizations too. Um, and – what we would do is just send them a follow-up email. Just have that as another step in our process. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really helpful about a system that if something breaks down to think, what can I do to improve my process so that this does not happen again? You know, I remember us talking about this actually. And what I used to do is I used to send, after we were done, sometimes we were in a rush. So then I'd email, I would an email that I'd always send for them to book it. And we're like, why don't we just have them book it right on the call? And, yeah. like, and then it was like a head slap, yes. So that's what I do. That's a, that's I just, a great part I of the just, process, and I see that in your notes too. I just message it, them. In, it's in the notes I send them. I met. I just in Skype. I go. Here's the link. Book a time, and it solves the problem that's too. Even better than adding another step as a follow up. Yeah. Yeah. So we always do have that follow up just in case, but um, but it's better to just get them right there. Yeah. So then once they're once I've done the interview with them, I move them over to one more column to the last column in the system. At that point, we automatically fire off an email to Joe, the editor, the guy who I met from Guatemala. And the way I do that is I use Zapier a lot. I love Zapier. What Zapier does is connects to all, all kinds of software, and it takes action based on what you tell it to do mm -hmm. or based on what happens in that software. So I connected Zapier to Pipedrive, and I said, as soon as somebody goes to column 10 in Pipedrive, send an email with that person's name and their company name to Joe, the editor. And here's what the email should say. It should say, hey, Joe, this interview is done. Here's the person's name. Here's the person's um, company name. And here's where you can go find the raw interview that Andrew uploaded yeah. to, our, uh, to our Google Doc, to our Google Drive. And that's it. And then Joe downloads the file from Google Drive. He edits it, turns it into both video and audio, submits the interview to the transcription service, and then puts... Um, goes to our WordPress uh, backend and puts the person's name, puts the person's uh, company name, puts the embed code for the video on there, puts the link to his edited audio file in there, and that's, his, that's the end of his part. At that point, Ari comes in, 
says the transcript is done. I'll copy it from the transcription service into this uh, WordPress post. And then she also writes a headline based on what I said to the guest. She writes the intro based on what I said to the guest. And she writes a bio based on who the guest is. How does she get then, pinged? How does she know that it's done? From um, Actually, I think... Think and I, I don't know because now things are changing a lot without me. We keep improving the system. You're like that's the best part about a system. It changes yeah. without you. Yeah. What what I rigged up was I said, Joe, you shouldn't actually now that I think about it, you shouldn't have to go into the back end, back end of WordPress. I'll create a separate page that's just for you that just is a simple form that says, What's the guest name that you just edited? What's their company name? What's the link to the MP3 and what's the embed code? Put that in and hit submit. As soon as he does that, Ari gets an email saying, Ari, Joe finished editing, and it's and she knows that it's uh, it's on her to publish the interview. Yeah, so I want to back up for a quick second about, so where do you upload it so Joe can get it? I, I use Google Drive now. You do? Really? Yeah, I used to use Rackspace. Wow. And the reason that I like Google Drive is... It's so easy to upload to. You don't need another. You don't need another app to use it. With Rackspace and with Amazon S3, if I'm going to share files back and forth, I need another app. I don't like uh, mm. Dropbox for this because I know if I upload a big file to my Dropbox and Joe shares it with me every time I upload a new file, he has to like he, yeah. it eats away at his Dropbox space. Right. Versus we have a community. Um, Google Drive folder yeah. for this stuff, and if I upload files into it and share the file, the folder with him, he doesn't have to lose any space. That's interesting. Plus, I also want the whole team to get used to the fact that Google Drive is where our, all our data is. So if Ari is wondering where is this interview, she doesn't have to go to Rackspace or Drive, or she just knows everything's in our Google Drive. I'm going to go see if Andrew uploaded it or if there's a problem. Right. So perfect. And then so he does it. Then he. He uploads it to. Does he upload it back to Google Drive or or Wistia? No, he, puts he it on uploads Wistia. at that point. He uploads it to Libsyn, and from Libsyn he gets the link that he puts into the URL that he puts into our site. And he'll upload it to Wistia and put the embed code. Yep, there. And so Ari now does the post. Mm -hmm. So now what happens? Once Ari writes it up, she schedules it to go up and she keeps a spreadsheet with when each interview is supposed to get published. And once it's published, Andrea gets pinged and she emails the guest and says, we published your interview. Any issues, let us know. And if there aren't any, would you please help Andrew promote it by tweeting it, putting it on Facebook, etc. What else do you do or recommend as far as promoting it? For people, I really should be doing so much more to promote it. I'm not doing that much. I I will talk to guests sometimes. This is something I learned from Jordan Harbinger, um, who was in that interview your heroes course. That he asks a guest to help promote when he talks to them. So I do that, um, and that helps. But I still think we should do a lot more. Uh, recently, we started actually buying some ads for them. Just Facebook ads. We tried Google AdWords or AdSense. AdWords didn't work out that well. We're now trying Facebook. It's it's okay. I mean, you do posts on Twitter and Facebook and oh yeah, like yeah, that we too. Do that for sure. Yeah, for sure. Um, so <clears throat> what else? Anything else? So just some of the software to mention: Pipe Drive, Ecamm Call Recorder, Google Drive, use Evernote, um, Zapier is a big one. Zapier is a big one. Yeah. I do use Evernote for my notes, but I have to tell you, Jeremy, we're actually shifting to just using Google, Google Drive, Drive for notes yeah. instead of Evernote. Yeah. It makes sharing a lot easier. People are more familiar with it. I, I much prefer using Evernote because yeah. Evernote has a really narrow profile on my desk, so I, I don't have to take much space on my desk on my computer desktop yeah. for it, but it's too much of a pain for sharing. Yeah, yeah. Anything else that we're missing in this process that people should know about? Yeah, research tools. I think people don't spend nearly enough time doing research. Um, so that's a good place to close it. Mm -hmm. What I do is if somebody says that they if, – if I for every person whose site I have, I go – sorry, for every person who I interview who has a site and who doesn't, I go to SimilarWeb to see where they get their traffic, to see where they send their traffic. 
I also check to see if I ever interacted with them. At this point, I've been in the tech space for so long that there's a good chance that when they were starting out, they emailed me. And so I want right. to go and see what they emailed embarrass me Embarrass them by reading, no, like the old Sorry? email. You embarrass them by reading the old email they sent. They love it. Yeah. Love it. Um, I also see if there's anything negative about them online. Did they, so a simple search is to just look for the company name and the word sucks or to look for review. I'm a little cautious with reviews because affiliate scammers use it a lot, but. Bless you. Thanks, I hit the mute button before sneezing. Well, I don't edit any of these because of you, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people should see that we actually do edit. At some point, I feel like podcasting is going to be a little bit like fashion photography where you look at fashion photos and the women have no knees because there are wrinkles and knees <laughs> and you have to just airbrush every wrinkle out. And so the women look so, so wrong that they have no knees and they're setting this false expectation in their viewers' minds of what a woman should look like. And I think if we keep editing podcasts down to the point where we have no ums and we have no failures and no right. dopey questions, we get to a place where people start to assume that every, especially for me and entrepreneurs who I would interview, that every entrepreneur is so perfect that no one else could match up to them. Yeah. And I know that there are a lot of places online where people do that, right? They're, venture capitalists now own substantial parts of a lot of the media about the startup community and they have power to influence what's said there and they want to make their people look perfect i don't want to participate in that i want to make them look much more real yeah yeah andrew this has been fantastic you know even after five years of working with you and doing interviews and pre-interviews, I still learned a ton from what you said. And so thank Thanks. you so much. And maybe let's end on Gary V. Like you're going to interview Gary V in a little bit and you want to maybe finish with something. I don't with know what, I, it's minutes away. I still don't know what I'm going to ask him and this is unusual for me. And I got, I, I usually will read the book, but this one is hard for me to get through. Not because it, it's Gary not v. a good book. This yeah. is Ask Gary V. The challenge that I have with Ask Gary V's book is that there isn't one one thought that goes through the whole thing he's answering a bunch of questions every page yeah. has about one question on it and it keeps changing so i can't get into a big rhythm with it at the yeah. same time i like the way he writes he writes like he talks and so i'm getting sucked right. into freaking reading it um and i only got the book fairly recently so i didn't get much time to look at it I don't know what I'm going to talk to him about. Frankly, I don't know that it'll even be about this book. I have to just get in touch with what am I curious about with yeah. Gary Vee. What do I need to know? And I know yeah. my audience. What should they know from Gary yeah. Vee? Yeah. So I have um, – if I did the pre-interview for this, what I would do is I would want to know what you disagreed with in the book from his answers. You know, if you – if certain things you saw his answer to something – I'm curious of what out of his answers you disagreed with and have a conversation, part of the conversation be around what you disagreed with in his answer. That's my, that's my good, personal curiosity. That's a good point. I actually yeah. even highlighted a point where I think he disagreed with himself and I want to talk about the contradiction. I don't right. think that he was, I don't think, yeah, yeah I think there's just like two points of view here that I want to clear up. As you were saying, as you're saying that, I, th I think you're right, and it's giving me a launching point for a couple of other questions. Like, what have my audience, what have his, which of his points did people in my audience disagree with that I should be bringing up? Yeah. yeah. All right. I'm going to go All right. for it. Do your thing. Thank you're you. You're awesome. Thank you so much. We interview your heroes. Check it out. Um, okay. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. What do the fire? Peaches, you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. <laughs>